sector that are recognized by the Army Corps of Engineers. And they, um, um, and, and they, it's not a rubber stamp, but it is certainly a much less aggressive review of your uh, permit if you fall within the guidelines of the PGP. And then once you have gotten through the federal level of review, it goes back to the state for final approval. And at that point, you get your licenses that allow you to then um, start farming. And so it seems if you look at this to be a fairly straightforward and logical sequence from town to state to federal and then back to state again. Um, so what I'd like to do is sort of talk about this in a little bit more detail. And I'm going to use a, uh, a situation um, that is near and dear to my heart. Um, I recently retired from uh, teaching at Roger Williams University down in Rhode Island. And uh, as you can see in this cartoon, there are different options for retirement. Um, and I chose not to sit around and wait for death, but to um, take on a, a new enterprise with my retirement. And so I joined up with two partners and we established Blue Stream Shellfish. It's an LLC. And we're in the process of um, permitting a, uh, a site in uh, Mattapoisett, which is on the south coast of, of uh, Massachusetts. I'll show you that in a minute. And we're, um, we're going to be looking at growing oysters and and kelp to start off with and then potentially branching into other um, things. My, my partners are actually fish farmers. Uh, they run a trout hatchery in, on Cape Cod, a large recirculating fin fish culture facility in Western Mass and a trout culture facility up in New Hampshire. And so I'm, uh, I'm taking them kicking and screaming into the world of invertebrates with, uh, with oyster culture. And they're quite excited about it actually. Um, so let's talk a little bit about Blue Stream. So, and I draw your attention to the south coast of Massachusetts and into Rhode Island. And if you look closely, you'll see a little red blob there uh, that represents a farm site that is um, just uh, over the border from Fairhaven, Massachusetts in the town of Mattapoisett. And if we look a little bit more closely, uh, you can see here that on this navigation chart, the, uh, the site's been outlined in red. It's right at the convergence of Nascatucket Bay and Buzzards Bay. And it is bounded uh, to the west by Fairhaven. You can see Sconnecat Neck and West Island there. Um, and to the uh, north and uh, with the uh, Mattapoisett Neck and Mattapoisett Harbor and Brant Island Cove. And so this is the site that we are in the process of getting permitted. Um, this is a Google map version of it. You can see the town boundaries are right on the boundary between Fairhaven and Mattapoisett. And you might notice that the shapes on these two different um, depictions of our site are a little bit different. Um, and I will uh, I, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, so this site has actually a long history of aquaculture. It was initially licensed by the town in, uh, in May of 1990. Um, as a bay scallop farm. And it uh, represented 100 acres of, of deep water, about 20 feet of water, uh, 20 to 25 feet over the bulk of the, uh, the area. Uh, it's relatively nice, flat, sandy bottom. It's very well protected from the northeast storms out of the, in the winter, not so much protected uh, from the southwest winds in the summer. But um, overall, it looked like a fairly good um, place to, to grow shellfish. So as I said, it started out as a bay scallop farm and they were growing bay scallops in pearl nets and lantern nets, which I'm sure you've heard about from Seth because he's a big lantern net, pearl net guy. Um, and they were hanging those, uh, those nets off surface buoys in, the, in an array within this hundred acre uh, footprint. Um, the, uh, the previous owner, the initial owner of this was not particularly concerned about good environmental practices, I guess I could say, and uh, had a long history of, of not really policing the area and keeping it quite as uh, neat and clean and, and sort of minimizing any risks to uh, recreational boaters or whatever. And so he did not have a particularly good relationship with the town. And then with some financial shenanigans that went on uh, between 
the original owner and some investors, he lost the farm in 2016 and it was taken over by a group that had uh, invested in his company. And so it changed ownership in 2016. Uh, however, the, the new owners were not much better in terms of maintaining the site than the previous owner. And so the town was quite upset about the way that the whole uh, area was being managed. And, um, and so they repeatedly warned both uh, the original owner and the second owner that unless they were to clean up their act, um, because there were instances of gear floating all around the bay and, um, and, and submerged lines that were hanging up um, the recreational boats that were running through the area. Here you can see, if you look carefully, there's a channel from Brant Island Cove out through here and people would be spinning off and running through the farm and getting hung up in long lines and just was not a very well maintained site. And so the bottom line is that the Board of Selectmen finally got tired of all of that um, harassment that they were getting from the general public about the, uh, the status of that site. And so they revoked the aquaculture license in April of 2018. Now, I was aware of this going on because actually one of my former students was hired by the second owner to manage that facility. <clears throat> and he lasted about three months before he left because he was not happy with the way that it was being managed. And so, um, so in, uh, with the revoking of the license in April of 2018, Bluestream came in I was anticipating grad, uh, graduating, retiring in 2020. And so we thought we would start getting it set up. And so on, in June of 2018, um, we submitted an application to the town to ask for them to transfer the license from the previous owners to Bluestream. And, uh, and this, this concept of transfer was an important aspect to our business plan because um, by transferring the license, that means that all of the existing permits that were uh, in place for that farm, and that farm had been on site for 28 years at this point, um, would then automatically be uh, relayed over to us and we would not have to go through any kind of an initial permitting process. So the Board of Selectmen, uh, after about a year of negotiating back and forth, uh, partly because of the status of the aquaculture regulations for the town, and the state forcing the town into clearing up its aquaculture regulations before it would allow us to come in and transfer that license. We finally got approved on the 10th of September of this past of 2019, a year and a half ago, um, to um, occupy that site. And so with that approval, I then submitted uh, a, notices to all of the other permitting agencies uh, informing them that this license, that this site transfer had taken place and that um, we would be assuming all of the permits for the, uh, for the site. And that's when we came into a very, very big surprise um, because not only was the site not maintained well, but it turns out that um, from 1990 on, most of the major permits for this site had never been um, gained. And so the site had effectively been operating illegally for 28 years and uh, no one was even remotely aware of it. And the state was giving both owners permits for holding and selling uh, shellfish. And um, it, so when I called up the Army Corps of Engineers and I said, hey, I'm gonna transfer these uh, licenses over. They said, geez, we have no record of any licenses for that site uh, in our files. But, you know, maybe it's the fact that 1990 records weren't maintained for aquaculture that uh, stringently. And so tell you what, why don't you go to the Division of Marine Fisheries and you get a copy of their initial permit, mail that to us, and then we'll make it happen that you can transfer this non-existent license. So I called up some of my um, uh, associates at Division of Marine Fisheries. And I said, hey, guys, can you send me a copy of the original permit for um, the Mattapoisett site, and they, uh, uh, shortly thereafter, I got an email from them now saying, Dale, would you mind coming in and talking to us? And so I showed up at the DMF office in New Bedford and sat down and they said, we have absolutely no record of any permits for this site um, in our files as well. And so this whole idea of transferring the license and 
sort of short size, short stepping the uh, permitting process came crashing and burning down around our ears. And so basically what was determined primarily by the Army Corps and then trickling down through the state was the fact that we needed to start from the beginning to get all of our permits for this uh, site. And so as I, as I noted and didn't mention, we initially applied for only 50 of the original 100 acres of this site. And that was due to some political discussions with the, with the town and what they were willing to allow us to work with and what they uh, were not. And so they were willing to give us 50 acres. And so we grabbed it. Um, but then because we had 50 acres, it exceeded the threshold for the Army Corps programmatic general permit, which has a 10 acre threshold. So anything under 10 acres falls under the, um, the guidance of the PGP but anything over 10 acres must then apply for what they call an individual permit, which undergoes much more intensive scrutiny because it's focused primarily on large marine construction projects, things such as large marinas or um, other marine um, wetlands associated construction. And so we had to go the individual permit route because of our 50 acre size. Um, the good news is that the state had been working um, over the past few years to put together a website that had a very detailed accounting of the application process for aquaculture. And uh, I've got the, uh, the website here, it's massaquacultureperimitting.org. And uh, they have a permitting tool in there that lists in a series of 12 steps what the pro permitting process is for um, a aquaculture site in Massachusetts. So I was about only about a quarter of the way through the application when they called me up and said, Dale, we've got this site, we, we don't have it published yet, but um, we'll give you access to it because uh, we know that you're going through a fairly extensive permitting process. So um, I went on that site and was very thankful because without it, as you'll see, as I start getting into the nuts and bolts of permitting, um, I would have been completely lost trying to go through the permitting process uh, in Massachusetts. So let's talk about this 12 steps of uh, permitting in Massachusetts. And so step one, and within this discussion, what I've done is I put the dates um, in uh, at each of the steps as to when um, we as Blue Stream Shellfish um, started and ended or was finally approved at each of these steps. And so on the immediately after the license was revoked from previous owners in 2018, I started talking with the town and primarily the harbor master who has authority for aquaculture in Mattapoisett um, to um, see about us assuming the responsibilities of that site. And so step two is to actually locate it. And that was easy for us because it had already been an active aquaculture site. So we knew that the growing classification, which is a a, a, a determination that the state makes in terms of human health risk. And so in, for shellfish aquaculture, you can only put farms in areas that are approved, which means that the shellfish can be harvested for human consumption. Uh, you need to de determine the growing area status, whether the town has uh, any kind of management closures in the area, uh, whether there's land owner or deeded rights. And so in Massachusetts, surprisingly, um, even though riparian laws are um, protect uh, subtitle lands or, or title lands to some degree, there actually is a situation where upland landowners in some cases have deeded rights to the tide flats. And so that is an important aspect of uh, you looking at your uh, site, uh, particularly if you're working in an intertidal zone, because we're a mile offshore, uh, that wasn't really a, a, an issue for us. And then you have to look at whether it's regulated or has protected resources in the area. And that includes both endangered or threatened species, but also uh, important habitat species like eelgrass um, on site. So once you've got your site sort of all, all figured out and you know pretty much what you wanna do, then you would apply for a municipal license. So you would go to the town and apply. So in each of these steps, if they have two asterisks next to them, that means that takes a formal application, uh, a written formal application. Sometimes they're um, prepared uh, documents that you just fill in the blanks. In other places, you have to generate them from scratch 
using your own creativity. And so in this case, uh, this is one that I generated from scratch. So I applied to the town for the site on the 28th of June in 2018. And it took them a little bit over a year to actually um, make a decision on that because as I mentioned earlier, they had to get their aquaculture regulations in tune and in step with the state's approval process before. And that took, uh, I think it took about eight months for that to happen. And so we got our um, municipal license. Um, you're also in some towns, they have fishing permits, commercial fishing permits. Um, nobody in Mattapoisett has said anything about that to me yet. And so I'm just keeping my mouth shut and hoping that they don't, um, don't come back and, and require me to get that. Although that's generally just a general um, application and immediate response. So once you get approval at the municipal level, then you have to move on to get state site certification. And this includes uh, an environmental review, which is a paper review of the site. And so I submitted uh, that in May of 2020 and, uh, and uh, was got a response back on the 8th of July, uh, certifying the site as being acceptable. And then they have to do an actual site inspection. So in the, my case, in 20 feet of water, we had to take out a team of divers uh, to have them run a um, site inspection uh, in situ. So they, they swam the site, um, did quad, uh, transects for determination of resources on the site, and then uh, were made the determination that there were no um, um, red flags in terms of uh, important resources on the site that may be impacted by our activities at the site. So we were received our site certification um, in, in early August of 2020. And again, that took a formal application. Um, at that point, we had to file a notice of intent with the Town Conservation Commission. Now, Town Conservation Commissions are tasked with enforcing the wetlands regulations for each of the individual towns. Uh, this is another uh, responsibility that the state has given the towns. And so because uh, submerged lands are considered part of the wetlands of the state, the Commonwealth, uh, then we had to notify the Conservation Commission that we were um, proposing to farm there and uh, they had to review our application. And then um, what they do is rather than approval, they give you an order of conditions where they tell you what you can and can't do on the site. And so we worked closely with the Conservation Commission, the conservation agent, and submitted an application. This was a very long pre-determined uh, form that we had to fill out, again, primarily directed at um, building construction in the wetlands, but we made it, adapted it to fit our purpose, submitted it on the 10th of May, and was able to get an order of conditions or approval by the Conservation Commission on the 30th of July. As part of that approval process, we had to file a formal application with the Mass Natural Heritage and Endangered Species Program, which is in place to protect, um, obviously, our endangered species, uh, of which there were a number that had been known to populate our site, including three species of terns, um, a number of marine sea turtles, and potentially some marine mammals. And so we had to uh, file with them to get approval. Um, and part of that approval process is to uh, be reviewed potentially under the Massachusetts Endangered Species Act or the MESA review. However, the MESA review is exempted from farms that have been in operation within the previous five years of the application point. And because this farm, uh, this site had been a, acting as a farm right up until this license was revoked in 2018, um, it took about a month's worth of, of um, back and forth with the MISA people, but they finally agreed to exempt us from Endangered Species Act review because of it being an active farm site. Uh, we also had to request for 401 water quality certification. This is a, um, a um, certification that's uh, awarded by the Mass Department of Environmental Protection, and that is to ascertain whether we will be compromising water quality uh, on the site. And so we were able to get approval through our 401 certification on the 28th of August in 2020. So we're chugging right along. And, and each one of those filings that are listed there required a formal application. 
um, including with the water quality certification application, we had to um, write a document that um, listed alternatives to our proposed farm site. And so I had to do a fairly in-depth analysis of why our site was good and why other sites weren't so good. Um, and so that takes, it's a bit of a challenge to, to generate that in a way that's acceptable to DEP. Um, and then um, under some circumstances, if you're going to be putting permanent structures in the water, then you have to apply for chapter 91 waterways authorization, again, through DEP. However, because all of our cages were transit, transitory and there was no permanent structures on our site, we were um, uh, not required to file for chapter 91 uh, authorization. Uh, step seven was uh, once we got through all of that was to file with the Mass Bureau of Underwater Archaeological Resources uh, because we had to demonstrate that there were no important archaeological resources like, um, you know, um, Spanish galleons with lots of gold that had sunk on our site or, or uh, potential uh, former Native American sites. Um, and so we filed with the Mass Bureau of Underwater Archaeological Resources, got uh, agreement back on the 4th of August that there was no resources to worry about. Um, but that did include notification of the Native American tribes in the vicinity, so we had to contact the two Wampanoag tribes in, uh, on Cape Cod and, and Martha's Vineyard. And then we, uh, we were re asked to file with the Mass Historical Commission. However, I argued against that because the Mass Historical Commission is um, actually in um, responsibility is to regulate historical buildings in the, uh, in, in the Commonwealth. And I was successful to argue that a mile offshore and 20 feet of water there probably weren't any buildings that we, they would have to worry about. That, that took three weeks to get that uh, taken care of. Step eight was to then uh, request MEPA review, Mass Environmental Protection Act review. Um, and part of that involves uh, making sure that our um, use of the resource was consistent with coastal zone management regulations. So we had to file for coastal zone management regulations uh, of, federal consistency. And then part of that was to make sure that we were compatible with the Federal Ocean Sanctuaries Act and the Ocean Management Plan, which sort of fell under that consistency review. Um, and so we were able to um, get the consistency review, but we sidestepped the MEPA review because the actual impact of our, um, of our equipment that we're going to have on site consisted of less than a half an acre of direct contact with the bottom. And so if you looked at the feet of our cages and the anchors that we had out, it came to 0 0.43 acres of impacted bottom. So we were able to just uh, barely slip under the threshold for MEPA review, which is a fairly extensive review that in some cases requires an environmental impact assessment, which is a, a fairly large uh, undertaking. Um, that leads us, so we've now basically gotten through the, uh, the state level of review and that we get bumped up to the US Army Corps of Engineers. And so I have um, applied to the Army Corps of Engineers on the 10th of August, and I am still um, dealing with the US Army Corps of Engineers. And I will give you a few more details on that in just a minute. And so um, as part of the federal review, we also have to be in touch with the Coast Guard to uh, get approval of the marker buoys that we put out on the site um, and the, uh, the moorings for those buoys. But we can't do that until we get Army Corps of Engineers uh, approval. Um, so this is basically where we are at this point is waiting for US Army Corps of Engineers approval. Um, the next steps uh, coming up uh, are, if we were discharging water, we would have to file for a National Pollution Discharge Elimination System or NEPDES permit, but because we're not discharging any water, it's not required of us. Uh, and then once we get federal approval, we go back to the state, as I mentioned earlier, and we apply for a DMF aquaculture permit, which is basically a uh, written form, uh, happens in one hour. And, uh, and that allows you to hold sublegal size commercial species, such as uh, small oysters. And then you have to apply for a fishing permit, which allows you to sell those commercial species uh, on the, in the wholesale market. 
So those are the 12 steps. And I just, I wanna hone in uh, on this whole application process. So, so far we've had to submit nine unique applications um, to all of the various agencies. Each one of these applications was different, um, but they all included one major component and that was our operations plan. And so that operations plan is basically a document that outlines what you wanna do, where you wanna do it and how you're going to get it done. But it also includes how you're going to address any critical risks that may be of concern to um, any of the reviewing agencies. So here you can see the front page of our operations plan. It was a 15 page document that basically just outlined what we wanted to do and how we we're gonna get it done. And then, so you would, we, we included this operations plan in each one of our applications, but then you also have to tailor that oper operation or that application to uh, address the responsibilities of, uh, of whatever the reviewing agency is that you're submitting the application to. So uh, not only do you have this sort of generic boilerplate operations plan that gets included, but then you have to do a custom um, designed application to cover that uh, as you uh, apply to each of these different agencies. So you really have to have an understanding of what the re agency review responsibilities are, what their mandate is, and then how you can um, deal with that in terms of your uh, operations. So I wanna just talk a little bit because I'm right in the middle of my federal review and it's driving me absolutely crazy. Um, I thought I would just give you a quick rundown as to what, uh, what the federal review uh, is, is happening there. And so the first thing that they do is they have to send it out for public comment. And um, so I submitted my application in mid August and uh, unfortunately, the, the, the um, core agent that was uh, overseeing my application was um, promoted in her job and uh, became a, a higher level administrator. And so she had to hand off my um, package for review to uh, a person that had been promoted into her previous position. And unfortunately, the new person had never even looked at an aquaculture uh, application before. And so it took her about a month and a half just to get up to speed so that she could publish the public notice for public comment, uh, which happened on October 20th. So it took them three months just to get my federal application um, recognized and um, put out for public comment. So there's a mandated 30 day public comment period uh, where people can request and get my operation plan so that they can then uh, provide feedback. And we got one um, fairly extensive letter uh, from a fairly well-known uh, non-governmental organization um, that um, commented on our application. And uh, I'll be perfectly honest with you, that, that NGO letter was um, probably one of the more dishonest representations of science that I have had to deal with. Um, they fabricated uh, a number of different uh, examples of uh, potential conflicts that in reality never existed. Uh, the only reason that I was able to counter that is because of my technical skills, um, but it was very disappointing that that, that group would go to the extent of um, fabricating data to try to block the development of our shellfish farm. And so I was able to um, counter their arguments and um, hopefully put them in their place. I still haven't decided how I'm going to deal with it. Once I get my permits in place, there's a good chance I'm going to go back and actually challenge the individual directly to, uh, to see if I can figure out exactly what their motivation was. We also, as part of this public, uh, Army Corps <coughs> review is to go through a NOAA section seven review, section seven review uh, addresses endangered species, marine species. And uh, their primary concern with our uh, review process was any kind of vertical lines and entanglements. Uh, as you're probably aware, there's a huge issue now, uh, particularly in Cape Cod Bay with right whales and uh, vertical lines going to lobster traps or gill nets or whatever. And so uh, that, because it's such a sensitive issue and is constantly in the press, 
that uh, immediately came up as a red flag for our system because we have vertical lines that are uh, attaching buoys to lobster ca uh, oyster cages on the bottom, very much like a lobster trap. And we also had vertical lines that were anchoring our kelp lines because we were also going to be doing kelp culture in the winter time. And so we had to uh, come up with alternatives to these um, ver vertical lines to minimize the risk for entanglements. So that entailed um, putting uh, breakaway links on our buoy lines to the oyster cages. And so the primary concern with that was uh, marine sea turtles, particularly leatherbacks. And so they requested that we put 600 pound breakaway links on our vertical lines so that if anything were to entangle in them, if they exerted 600 pounds of effort against that line, it would break away. Now, nobody's ever been able to actually demonstrate that a 600 pound breakaway is effective for leatherback turtles, but that seems to keep everybody's happy. So I'm perfectly fine with putting 600 pound breakaways. The other thing that we did was we doubled up on our trawl lines. So we reduced the number of vertical lines for oyster cages by half with our uh, system. Um, and so hopefully, uh, as far as I know, that kept everyone happy. They also didn't like our, our uh, lines on our uh, kelp uh, system. But unfortunately, even the highest of the strength breakaway links, which are 1700 pound breakaways that they use for areas where right whales may be uh, uh, compromised um, are not strong enough to hold a kelp line under full sea conditions. Uh, I get that information from a kelp farmer down in Connecticut who has tried break 1700 pound breakaways on his kelp lines and um, th they break before he even puts any kelp on them. Um, and so um, their solution, our, my solution was to recognize that these lines are in tension they're not slack. And so if a uh, marine mammal were to hit this line, there's not enough uh, give to the line to allow it to entangle. They basically would just bounce off it. Um, so we uh, have designed our system so that it is entirely in tension with the exception of a few buoy lines that are maintaining the depth of the kelp line. And those are sheathed in PVC pipe so that there is no flexibility to the line and therefore again, will not uh, wrap up on a fin or uh, get, get caught and um, uh, wrapping around a, a marine mammal or, or sea turtle. And so we have responded with agreement on 600 pound breakaways for our oyster cages and high tension and rigid lines for our kelp lines. And we're hoping that that will be acceptable um, to the Army Corps. And so far they've indicated that that should be uh, fine because it meets the uh, federal requirements that are currently in place. Um, there is also potential for essential fish habitat review, but again, that has a half an acre threshold. And because our actual impact zone is less than a half an acre, we're not required to do essential fish habitat review. And then most recently, um, I've found out that we are now under US Fish and Wildlife Review because about a half a mile away from our site is a roseate tern nesting site which is uh, an endangered, I believe it's endangered, it may be threatened species that is uh, very much on the radar of um, fish and wildlife. And so, but they're, they're fine as long as we don't have any structures um, moored on the surface that is big enough for a turn to nest on it because they don't want them putting nests on temporary structures. And so because all of our system is on the bottom, uh, there isn't any risk to that. And so I think we'll be fine with the with the roseate turn nesting site um, uh, question. The other thing is that there is a recreational boating channel between our farm and the nesting site. And so I argued that the, uh, the um, recreational boating community flying back and forth in that channel is probably much more of a detriment to roseate turn nesting, <coughs> excuse me than our um, basically sedentary boat that's working on the site handling uh, oyster cages. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to finish up here um, quickly with some of my thoughts on the Massachusetts shellfish permitting scene. And then I want to quickly contrast that with one in our neighboring state of Rhode Island. And so um, just to give you a, a summary of my current thoughts and, and up front, you need to 
we need to recognize that both the history of our proposed site and the size of the site had really has bumped us up into a higher order review than a conventional shellfish farm. But nevertheless, you would, um, there are some things to think about. Uh, on the plus side, um, every single person that I worked with at the town level, at the state level and the federal agency level were extremely helpful. Uh, they, they were willing to advise us on ways to um, provide our applications that would minimize uh, any kind of um, adverse comment. <coughs> And they helped us with uh, with guiding me through all of these various hoops that I had to jump through for permitting. And so I can't uh, praise them enough for their help and their advice. Although in many cases, they really did not have a very good understanding of exactly what normal aquaculture practices were. And so it took me a while to educate them before I could um, we could sort of put our heads together as to uh, the application process. However, um, all of those really nice people are severely handicapped by a regulatory environment that really is the antithesis of user-friendly. If you were to try to work your way through that um, permitting process just by uh, emails and talking to people on the phone, it would take you an extremely long time to try to figure out exactly what the permits were and uh, how you had to apply for them. Because the application process is really convoluted it's very obtuse, it's not obvious, it's not user-friendly, and it is um, exceedingly frustrating. Um, the other thing is that there's an incredible amount of redundancy in the application process, and, and the applicant is the one that's forced to deal with that. So I had to write nine different applications. I have still two more to go, um, which all, all, for the most part, contain almost all the same information just tweaked a little bit to, um, to address the regulatory agency. Um, and then lastly, the, the turnaround time for many of these reviews is, uh, is unreasonably long. Um, we applied in uh, 2018, anticipating having oysters in the water in 2019. It's now 2021. There's an outside chance I may be able to get oysters in the water this spring, but um, I'm not holding my breath because I still have not gotten that federal review, which is uh, at this point, the, uh, the primary stumbling block. So with that criticism in mind, I wanna talk a little bit about Rhode Island's process. Um, Wait, Dale, so, I, just wanna, I just wanna add one thing. You guys sure. need to understand that Dale has been in the aquaculture space for many, many years. And so he's talking about how arduous this process was, and that's coming from a person who's got a depth and wealth of experience in aquaculture. If you can imagine someone coming to this without yeah. that background, it would it would be extraordinarily a large hurdle to get through, I believe. Yeah, you know, so for years now, we've been surveying the aquaculture industry saying, what are the primary hurdles to the development of aquaculture in the US? And they always kept saying regulations, regulations, regulations. And I, you know, in the back of my mind, although I never verbalized this, I said, oh, they're just whining. It's just, you know, it can't be that bad. Um, and then I tried to go through it myself. And uh, I can tell you right now that as soon as I get all of my permits in hand, my cause celebra is going to be to start banging on state, federal agencies to try to streamline the, uh, the application process in Massachusetts. And I think Rhode Island is an excellent example of how that can be done, which is why I wanted to present this to you guys. And so in Rhode Island, first of all, it's not a home rule state. And so although the towns do not have authority over aquaculture, they do have potential for input. And so um, when someone is interested in starting a farm in Rhode Island, uh, they submit a preliminary application to the Coastal Resources Management Council, which is where the aquaculture coordinator for the uh, state sits. And that is equivalent to our coastal zone management agency here in Rhode Island. And so they, they submit a preliminary application to uh, the aquaculture coordinator at CRMC. And the coordinator calls together an informal discussion amongst all of the review agencies and the applicant 
where they all sit down, at least pre-COVID times, and met face to face and went through the application and identified any potential red flags that may be associated with that application. That meeting was, notes from that meeting are then digested by the aquaculture coordinator. They send a letter back to the applicant saying, um, this is what you need to do to modify your application in order to make it acceptable. And then the applicant will then submit a one full aquaculture application to the state coordinator. And that person in turn then distributes it to all of the various agencies and stakeholder groups that need to uh, weighed in on the decision-making process, as well as making it available for 30-day public comment. Uh, all of those agencies review um, the, um, the application, the single one application, and they provide feedback back to the Coastal Resources Management Council. If there are no objections, then you automatically get approval. If there are objections, there's a public hearing with the Coastal Resources Management Council formal hearing. And uh, at that point, at that point in time, they will make a decision whether to approve or deny. And so each of these uh, review steps that you see between the full application, uh, full aquaculture application and the CRMC, they have 60 days to respond. If they don't respond within 60 days, then the assumption is made that there are no objections and the permit application moves on. And so they have, uh, streamlined their application process to the nth degree with one application, a 60 day turnaround uh, demanded of the uh, review agencies, and then an immediate uh, or near immediate um, decision as to whether yes or no. And so that really um, is the um, exact opposite of what we see in Massachusetts and is, is really a very, uh, nice goal to, uh, to direct our attention to in the future. <coughs> so with that, I will, uh, I will, before I run back to my secret lair with my uh, trusty sidekick Oyster Boy, I will be happy to entertain any questions that people might have. So I will stop sharing my screen and we can, uh, we can chat if people want to Great. do that. Thank you so much. So is anyone going to quit the class and like give up their dream of hosting an, an aquaculture farm based on No, that? please please don't do that. <laughs> I will tell you that if you if you fall under that 10 acre guy the threshold then you're um, it's so much easier. Um, it makes uh, it will make your life a lot easier. It, and Currently is an initiative right now of um, something you know the Mass Aquaculture Association um, and the state are working together in the Mass Shellfish Initiative, which yes. I believe is trying to kind of make the whole process more uniform in the state of Massachusetts. Um, so there is currently an initiative underway to do that. Um, and Mass, the MassShellfishInitiative.org has its own website. I'll put it in the chat. Yep. Yeah, so I, have, I have refrained from participating so far because I don't want to bend any noises out of joint before I get my permits in play hand. Yeah. But um, as soon as that happens, I, there's a good chance that I might um, become a little bit more involved. And actually, just for a shameless plug, um, the the Mass Shellfish Initiative came out of one of my classes. So, yep. so that's kind of cool at UMass. Anyway, who has questions? I'm sure someone does. And it doesn't have to be about permitting because Dale's been in this space for many, many years, research-wise, permitting-wise, growing-wise, education-wise. Feel free to ask anything you'd like. Yeah, fire away. Diane, I see you unmuted. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. So having dealt with regulatory myself through the FDA, <laughs> yep. um, I can, I have a hint of what your pain is like. Um, although I have to say the Massachusetts situation is described as a 12 step plan of the true 12 step plans. Of <laughs> um, so what happened in Rhode Island that led them to streamline and how long ago was that? I have to yeah. think if this picks up that Massachusetts will just be swamped with applications and the system will stop working, which isn't good for the business economy. 
Um, so Matt, uh, Rhode Island passed a state aquaculture act, which sort of facilitated all of this streamlining. Uh, I want to say it was maybe 25 years ago. And it was primarily because of the action of one of the state senators who ha was representing, um, uh, actually, <laughs> to, to talk about sort of the behind the scenes, she was very um, concerned with the way the Department of Environmental Management was overseeing aquaculture. And so she was the one that had that whole thing bumped into the Coastal Resources Management Council because she was pissed at the DEM in, in Rhode Island for the way they were managing aquaculture. And so as part of that transition from Department of the Marine Fisheries Department of Environmental Management over to the Coastal Resources Management Council, they also integrated all of this streamlining legislation in the act to, um, to, to make it all work better. And it, it really has been a very successful um, transition. And, and also I believe Maine's process is a lot more streamlined as well. Yes, yeah. Yeah, I'm not, I mean, Maine has, <coughs> they've got a bunch of different categories, uh, levels that you can apply for in the, in the Maine system, uh, starting at a very small scale and then scaling up to a full, full blown commercial enterprise. And so that allows you to sort of step through as you progress your business. And uh, that's, uh, that's a really nice feature. Uh, the way that Maine has set up their permitting process. Roseanne? Yeah, I, I, I remember in the reading somewhere um, talk about um, like bulk, bulk permitting, permitting whether it was a larger organization has already gone through the permitting process and then they sub license to smaller growers. Does that exist in Massachusetts? Or it, it does actually. A number of the towns on the Cape have done what they sort of call block permitting. Wow. And so they would go in and permit a 50 acre area um, at the at the state and federal level. And then they would break that up into two to five acre plots and have individuals come in. And all they have to do is apply to the town then for that smaller plot because they have um, they've already passed the state and federal um, survey for review. It's a, it's a good idea. I have a little bit of heartburn with that um, because aquaculture is a rapidly evolving industry and what might be a good site today may not be the best site tomorrow uh, as the technology changes and so by by basically zoning the the water sheet into an area where you yes or no you can do aquaculture you can't you may be really limiting the the, the future development of the industry if that technology should change. So, I mean, it, it certainly has some good aspects, particularly in terms of simplifying things for the, the town, the citizens of the town. But I, I don't like to see the sites getting uh, restricted based on, on this block permitting or zoning type of uh, exercise. Thank you. Sort of related, the one thing that I didn't find in the reading is, is there a, a more substantial review or renewal or process that you have to do every so many years? Again, that's part of the town's regulations. Most of them have set it up. So it's a, you revisit the permit every 10 years or 15 years um, and you have to get recertified or re-permitted. Usually, unless you've really screwed up, this is a um, sort of a, a, a just a, an exercise um, to be done. Although the, the site that I'm at, it was their annual or their their 10 year review where they actually, the town took the initiative to take it away from them. So if you do screw up, it does give the town an opportunity to, to revisit review and, and rectify if they have to. Hey, Jack, did you have any questions? Uh, yeah, I did. Um, curious, give or take, would you say most coastal states would follow the Massachusetts way or the Rhode Island way of permitting? <laughs> yeah, I guess it depends on the maturity of the industry in the state. Um, in those states where they have, uh, well, I'm not sure that's true. In, in many states, that's, that's my parrot in the background in case you hear something screaming. Um, 
in, in many states that have had an industry for an extended period of time, uh, they've sort of got evolved into a much more streamlined application process as the state review agencies become more comfortable with the industry and the normal practices of the industry. So um, Massachusetts is sort of the exception of that because we've had shellfish aquaculture here uh, since the 1960s. And actually you can actually track all the way back to the early 1900s if you want to in some circumstances. And yet they still have, uh, have really confounded the permitting process. I think that's part of, partly because of this home rule um, um, sort of overarching structure of the way that the state manages some of its resources. Um, Molly, I don't know at the beginning you looked like you had a question that might seem a little bit unrelated right now, but feel free. Um, I was just kind of you know, surprised to hear that the NGO is kind of combative and may have misrepresented information. And I was just curious if that's like common or something to expect. I was, I was equally surprised. I was very, um, did not expect, I mean, I, I, I certainly was not surprised that they came out sort of with a negative attitude towards it um, be, because I anticipated for that from them. Um, only because they're they have a different uh, emphasis on the resources that they're trying to protect. Um, but what I was really surprised with, and and this was a credible scientist who um, literally quoted information that was wrong, um, and uh, and and that just sort of shocked me. Um, yeah, that's shock. That's shocking. Yeah, I won't I won't get into this whole idea of fake news, but. Uh, <laughs> Right. It right. seems to be a sign of the times nowadays. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. Does anyone else have any questions? I'm sure uh, Professor Levitt would make himself available yeah. you know, by email if you guys have um, questions going forward. Um, Dale, I'm just, do you mind if I put your email in the chat? No, that's fine. Please do. Great. Um, you could, why don't you, Put the one in the, uh, use my blue stream one. So it's dale at bluestreamaquaculture.org. So that's just it. I don't even think I use that one at blue. No, it's, it, I'm, I'm trying to transition away from the Roger Williams University one, even though I'm maintaining that. It's trying to be more professional. Okay. And bluestreamaquaculture.org, it's not a nonprofit, it's a for profit. No, 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 it's a business. Yeah. It's a, it's a series of LLCs that are all different aspects of aquaculture. Great. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate a lot of time that you gave us. And um, yeah, and I hope I didn't overstay my welcome. No, your saga. It's good for everyone to understand that this process is arduous and um, that there's a lot of agencies and a lot of steps. So I'm a policy wonk. I teach a lot of policy and I was smiling because <laughs> every aspect of ocean policy, every agency involved. Yeah, it's, it's overwhelming at times. When you start harvesting, then yeah. you see how complicated it really is from all the agencies that are in charge of the food that you're serving. Yeah, I know when Diane mentioned that she had to deal with FDA for uh, molecular stuff, we have to deal with FDA for food sales and it, that's turning into another nightmare the way that they're uh, trying to restrict um, shellfish sales be and um, shellfish uh, harvest areas. It's it's getting to be really ugly. Uh, right. We'll see how that all plays out over the next year or two. <coughs> well, thank you again. I really appreciate okay. it. And um, thank you guys for coming. I appreciate that too. We have another call next week, which I highly recommend. I'm going to invite Dale to it because it's um, on the financial aspects of your business plan. And he was a student last year and is also an accountant. So he's that's really, cool. He's got this down really well. Yeah, so, and I'm just a biologist, so anything I can get on the on the uh, business side is a big plus. Great. All right. Okay, no, see you later, folks. Thank you. Bye now. Thank you.